Hello, how are you today? Oh, that's good to hear. We're going to do something very exciting together now. We're going to try to defy gravity. And don't be afraid. It's, I know it's moonshot, but it's not the kind of gravity that will make you rise out of your chair. No, it's the kind of gravity that people experience when they work too long in a company and they don't really realize anymore what their tasks are contributing to the work they're doing for the customers. So when you want to realize this or when you want to experience this, just go to the train station tomorrow and you need to observe all of these people who go to work. You will see them like this, like... None of them like going to work, they hate going there, they don't feel well, they don't realize why they are doing this, probably just to earn some money. And that's making me sad, because our society is organized around work, right? We all go to work. And work is making a lot of the people who go to work unhappy. So there's something wrong with that, and we should try to change that. And personally, I changed jobs myself recently, and in this changing of jobs, you know, then you need to do job interviews, it was something new for me. And one of the questions asked to me by one of the interviewers was, describe me the management experience throughout all of your career that you are most proud of. And it's been a few years, so I had to think for a while. And what I came up with was our Chrysostomus party. When we were 18 years old, we were in high school. We were a group of 60 people. And we managed to organize over the course of a few months a whole big event where a lot of people were present, where we had a show, where we had a big party. We even managed to make a profit. We had 300,000 Belgian francs we gained that night. Yeah, very good. And we didn't even fight over who should have the benefits of that. So we managed to do all of that. Yet we were completely incompetent because we didn't have any training. We didn't have any management framework. We didn't have anything. No processes, no leaders, no nothing. Yet we managed to achieve this big thing. And we did it with a lot of pleasure. So to me, that was the management experience. I said, wow, this was the perfect form of organization. If work could be like that, I would love to go to work every day. And in fact, I was very lucky because when I studied, I, I was an engineer. When I came to work for the first time, it was in the golden era where there was a lot of money for technology companies. And I landed in a company with 400,000 people worldwide where work was really play. We could play with anything we wanted. We could invent things. We could put things together. Together, it was all very much fun. But then a few years later, when I grew a bit in the organization, and I started to do things that were not so much execution, but more towards decision, I started to realize that all of the play we did there wasn't so productive. Because there was another class of people in that company, most of them would call them managers, and they were playing another type of game. They were making decisions, and they were fighting over power, and they were making sure that the right things happened to keep the shareholders happy. And those people, it appeared, often threw away the work I did when I was playing with things, and those were nice things. So that's not so good. So I started to become a bit unhappy and saying, hey, this is not the kind of game I want to play. I don't want to be this big hotshot manager because all of this management is creating a distance between the people who do the work and the customers who benefit from the work. So this was my first disillusion in my career. I said, well, these big corporations, these big structures, they are not the future of work. This is not how humanity should organize work. But luckily, we came into an era where something new happened. Something very exciting, which we all use today. We came into the era of the internet. And the internet was wonderful, not only because it's a new technology causing a lot of new possibilities for us, but also because it's a new industry. So you have new products, you have new markets, you have new business models, everything is new. So this whole internet industry has everything to reinvent how we organize work. And indeed, it happened when you go to Google, you see slides taking people from floor to floor. That's really nice. You see people taking care of each other. You see people having all kinds of facilities on site. So you see, wow, this is a company I think everyone here would love to work for Google, wouldn't you? So that's the very best company to work for. Yet when you talk to people who work at Google and who work there for some time, they tell you, well, it has become a bit too big. Maybe we're not the future here. Maybe Google isn't the company we should be working for. Because when you look at Google, 
or when I look at Google, and I don't know how many of you have visited Googleplex already, I got the impression when I was there that it was very much when I visited, like when I visited the coal mines in Belgium. You know, we had this big industry here in Belgium, taking coals out of the ground to create energy. And how we did that, we put up factories, and around the factories we created housing for the workers, and we created all kinds of facilities to keep them happy, etc. And what I saw there at Googleplex was actually the same thing as what we did to the workers here in Belgium in our factories. So Google didn't really reinvent the management model. They just applied it to a different industry. They have a different set of rules, but it's the same mechanism that is people making people unhappy. They're still creating tasks that create a distance between what people do every day and the value that is created for customer. And that's pe making people unhappy. So my second disillusion was, yeah, Google, Facebook, those companies don't have the answer to how we should organize work in our society. But luckily, and this really was a very good experience, and everyone here who hasn't had the experience yet, I would warm-heartedly recommend it to you, I joined the startup. I created a startup, and I got into the startup industry. And working in a startup is really terrific. It's really a fantastic experience that you can have. When you go to work in a startup, every day you feel like you're changing the world. You really feel like the two or the ten of you, no matter how many people you are, in a startup you get the feeling what we're doing here is fundamentally changing changing everything in the world. Why is that? Because there's a very short distance between the things you do in the morning and the features or the functionality that your customer is using in the evening. That's what's making you happy. You see the immediate result of your work. So to me, a startup is a very nice organization. It's a very good form to let people collaborate and have, productive, uh, have a productive day together. The only disadvantage of a startup is that it's a good organization, but only to find a new business model, only to discover things. It's not a good organization to execute things. And executing things is where it boils down to when you want to grow. And when you want to grow in a startup, you create things like what we now know as growth hacking. I don't know if you're familiar with the term growth hacking, but startups used to say, we don't do marketing. That's for the big companies with their big budgets who can buy television advertising. That's not what we do. We work for our customers, and they tell it to each other, and then we have more customers, and that's how we grow. In reality, also startups are competing against each other, and what you see is that they want to compete better. So they start to engage, well, they don't want to call it marketeers, they call them growth hackers, so they start to engage people who introduce activities who are not really beneficial to the end user. If you're sending out mailings to thousands of people to say, hey, we have a new feature, maybe that's not always the optimal experience for the end user. So when you start to introduce these kind of activities, you start to see within the startup culture, and I coached uh, a whole lot of startups, you start to see within this startup the same discontentment and the same mechanism that you see within the big corporations. So also in the startup world, we didn't really find the answer. So where does that leave us? I have three disillusions. I have these corporate organizations. Well, that's not really how the future of work should look like. I have the internet companies and I have the startups. Well, to me, there are only a few things that matter. It's not really the organization that matters. What matters to me is attitude. When you can give people the right attitude, I believe they will do the right things by themselves. A lot of people are naturally inclined to do positive things, to do the right things. When you put a call center operator in a call center and you make him take calls from customer and the customer tells a story and the operator says, yeah, I really understand you. This is something we screwed up. We'll fix it for you. They will do that automatically. But when you give them a set of rules and you take away their autonomy, they will no longer do that and they will take the rules for granted and they will do that. So whatever the form of organization we use to organize work, we need to make sure that people have a degree of autonomy so they can realize the right attitude and they can gain the right attitude through a culture. So that's something we need to ensure our form of organization that we're going to invent needs the right attitude. The second thing, and this is not so easy, you need to ensure that your organizational form has scalability. If you don't have scalability, you can't grow. If you don't have scalability, every new employee that comes in needs to learn the same lessons that the previous employees learned. So you need some kind of a mechanism so to take the lessons that you learned, for example, how should I invoice a customer correctly, to describe them in some way and to transfer them to new employees. So 
that's something you need to do, introduce mechanisms for scalability. And the third thing you need to introduce, and I hate to say it because I'm not a big fan of hierarchy, but definitely, if you want to create an organization where people do productive work, I am now convinced, after all these years of experience, you need hierarchy. Hierarchic models didn't appear by chance. If you look through the history of humanity, uh, of humanity and of history of nature, you will see that there always has been some kind of hierarchical structure. And this is because not everyone is like you, because everyone in this room, you are the thinkers. Eh? You work with your head and you think of how shall we do things. You're not the doers. If you were the doers, you wouldn't be sitting here. You would be at work now. And so you are the thinkers. So for you, this doesn't matter, the hierarchy. But the doers, for them, is very important. Because if there is no one who is thinking about what they should do, everyone is going to do something different, and they will be at a standstill. So they ask someone, hey, can you tell us what direction we should go? And then you get the form of hierarchy. So you need that hierarchy. Otherwise, the doers don't know what they need to do. So these three things you need, and well, I have personally made a, a, a sort of a model around that. I call it the liquid organization model. I will not explain you the whole model here. For that, you need to read the book, but I don't write books, so you can't read the book. Um, <laughs> but I'll explain you the three steps that you can take yourself. If you work in an organization today, there are three simple steps that you can take to apply, let's say, 90% of the result that my model is, uh, is, is causing. So for me, that is how we can defy this gravity, this thing that is waiting up on our shoulders and saying, ah, no, we can't change anything, because this is what, how gravity is defined within these big companies. They say, well, you have a certain degree of freedom, this you can decide. There's a certain degree of influence you can have. If you have a friend there and he understands you, he, you might be able to influence him, but for a lot of things, you can't change them. If you don't like them, just forget about it. They are what they are. That's gravity. Just accept it. And that, to me, is what is making people unhappy. And that is what I want to change in the corporate organizations model. So the three steps that you need to do to achieve that, to defy this gravity, the first one is truth-telling. Truth-telling is very simple. I love simple things. You don't need to learn a lot for it. To, give you, to, to, to illustrate what truth-telling is, when you go home in the evening and you talk about your day, your family will, well, Hopefully your family will listen for starters because a lot of people in management tend to babble on and describe things in a very difficult way. But if they understand what you're saying, they will reply with something like, or your kids will reply, oh, so mom and dad, so all you did actually was this. And you say, well, yeah, if you want to put it that way, okay. So truth-telling to me is just looking at things that are happening within the company through the eyes of a child and explaining it or rephrasing it in a very simple wording. That is true telling. To give you an example, the company I work for now, since a few months already, in the first week I worked there, it was a big corporate, it's Proximus here in Belgium, I found myself in a meeting, and the meeting had five people in it. And each of them had a laptop with them, a laptop in a meeting, and on that laptop was a PowerPoint presentation, and each of them had studied a tool. And we were, the, the, meet, the purpose of the meeting was to select a tool to do innovation funnel management, a certain type of process. So everyone pulled open their PowerPoint and explained all of the bullets they checked and all of the features they checked, etc. And the idea was that by comparing the features of these different tools towards the requirements set that was agreed upon beforehand, they would select the ideal tool. At a given moment in that meeting, I said, well, I'm just getting the impression here that none of you have ever done any innovation funnel management, the process by itself. So did anyone use any of these tools we're discussing here? So and all of them said, well, no, we, we haven't. You know, we just make the PowerPoint because that's what their job is. They need to compare these features. I said, well, I think then, is it true in my assumption, this is the true telling part, am I uh, correct in saying that none of you know what you're talking about when you're discussing these tools because none of you use them? They said, well, yeah, actually, you're right. I suppose we could break up the meeting, go to the website of the tool vendors, register for a demo account, use that for a couple of days, and come back. And so we did. And after a couple of days, we selected the tool, not based upon all of these requirements and these comparisons, but upon real life experience of what you actually want to do with these kind of things. So that's just a very simple example of how, by doing true telling, you can change things and how you can gain some sort of reputation for, oh, yeah, there is another way of doing things. So that's the first thing. You need to be a true teller within your company and do that in every meeting you go to. I assure you, you will have, 
well, I don't assure you that you will have success, but you will have some result of that. So that's the first thing, truth telling. Never in a personal way, never in an aggressive way, always telling the truth, observing what you see through the eyes of a child. That's the first step. The second step is that you need to find soldiers. You need to build yourself a little army of people who say, well, what you're doing, actually, that's nice. I, I want to do things that way as well. But I don't dare to, but I would like to. I would love to join you. I've created the Proximus Innovators Club at Proximus. So if you work at Proximus, you can join it. Eh? So we can have our little club. And we have the soldiers there, and we just meet them every month. So just to interact about what we think about the company, what are the evolutions that are happening. But we don't do anything yet. That's very important. Don't start these kamikaze projects where you say, everything we do here in finance or in I don't know what department is wrong, we want to do it differently. Never do that, because you are challenging people on what they do every day, you will create resistance. That's not what you should do. What you should do is you should wait. You should wait for the right moment, because in every big company, every few years, there comes a moment that top management sees, uh-oh, this is the plan, this is where we're heading. Mm, there's a big difference there. We're not bridging that. We're not getting there. So we need to do something radical. We need to change everything. So then comes a big reorganization, something disruptive, and usually then they create a burning platform. And I'll not explain all the, 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 the change management theory behind it, but what it boils down to is that management will create some flag and saying, well, we need to achieve this goal. If we get there, we'll all be saved. Everything will be fine. And this is the moment that you put your soldiers in action, because then, and this is something that top management will never refuse, if you have 40 people working down below on an execution level saying, yes, we understand where you want to go to. We understand where this flag is planted, and we want to be the task force that is getting us to that flag. We can do this. This normally never happens. If you do it, and I did it now through my consultancy practice with a number of companies, and now in Proximus, I assure you that top management will say, yes, you can do this, start your task force, and execute the project. The result of this is that your task force will succeed, because your task force is not fighting change. The rest of the organization will fight the change. No matter how they can, they will try to resist it. So will, they will be much slower in reaching the goal than you are. And by doing this, you will introduce a culture that will change the company forever. To give an example from within Proximus, um, my first 20 days within the organization, I interviewed someone every noon. So I went to have lunch with people and I interviewed them and I wrote it on my blog. If you want to read it, it's uh, 20kk.be. So 20kk.be. It stands in Dutch for 20 knappe koppen, 20 smart people. And I chose them based upon recommendations of their colleagues. And one of the guys who was a field engineer, he was working in the field, and he explained to me, well, when about 15 years ago, there were some bunch of people who started this task force to uh, start with digital TV, we all said, those guys are mad. Those guys are going to destroy our company. This will never work. Come on, what are they thinking? But now we say, when we talk amongst colleagues, field engineers, we say, those guys weren't mad. Those guys were very smart. They saved our company. Thanks to them, we reached that point. And even now, we realize that there is a way we can do things in the company which is different than the way we used to do things before. So we have this new culture as well. And this is very important. You're introducing a can-do culture in such a big organization. And this is what I think you can do with your task force in these three steps. So for me, this is what it boils down to. You need to make sure that you can defy gravity because gravity is often missing misunderstood and I have I'm very sure about this because this noon I talked to a physicist who assured me that my theory is correct because what I understood when I was in school about physics is that gravity is the fact that two bodies with a certain mass will always attract each other so the earth has a very big mass and I have a well let's say relatively small mass so when I'm standing on the earth I can't escape it because it's much bigger than I am but when within an organization you feel that the whole organization is waiting on you as a mass, the only thing you need to do is you need to gather enough people together to go into another direction, and when you gather enough people, you have enough mass to move the whole organization. And that is what I want you to do, to defy gravity. Thank you. Thank you.